Alright everybody, in my hands I hold the list that I compiled over the last couple of days of my top 25 games of the console generation 7. Uh, I decided to expand it to 25 just because it felt a little restrictive just doing 20. And honestly I could have done 30, I could have done 40, because, but then it would be less exclusive. So I felt like 25 was a good, was a good number. I don't want to do too much introduction here. <clears throat> Just uh, some quick things and get to the list because I'm, I'm planning to do this in two parts and there's 25 games i got to get through here and I want to do 15 in this part and I don't want this video to be 40 minutes long. So here's some quick stuff before we get to the list. First and foremost, again, for like the 500th time, this is just my opinion. If you disagree, that's fine. Second of all, the, the, the order of these probably could be switched around a little bit. Like if I... I mean, I just, I ranked these just because I have to rank things. I thought about only doing like a top five and then just listing like 20 other games. Not in order, but I couldn't do that. I had to rank because I'm, I'm a, I'm a rank-aholic. Um, <clears throat> so a lot of rankings here could probably be switched on, on a different day if I just felt uh, so inclined or if I was in a different mood. Um, but in general, I'm going to like number five better than number 19 or something like that. Uh, but a lot of times, if two are right next to each other, they can be switched. Um, and some quick rules. First of all, in order to make it on this list, it obviously had to have come out on a uh, console this generation. It had to come out on a video game console. That means no PC and no uh, iPhone games, no uh, handheld games. I'm talking like console, you put in your TV. And also, I was very, very restrictive here. Uh, no... No... Uh, compilations. I feel like that goes without saying. But I also restricted myself to, like, single games. And there were a couple times I was really tempted to do, like, oh, the whole series in a spot. But I, I really restricted myself to, like, a couple games. To, like, a singular games for each one. And that, that actually affected some of the ranking of some of these games. So I'll get to those when I get to them. But anyway, enough drivel. Let's get to the list. Uh, the main event here, my top 25 games of the generation, starting with number 25, Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare. Think back. Think back to when modern military shooters weren't a dime a dozen. They came out every, uh, Activision shook another Call of Duty off the tree every year. Remember back to when Call of Duty was a respected franchise, and they'd just come off of a relatively underwhelming Call of Duty 3. So... Now, this was back when it was still like a World War II shooter, right? So, rebooting the franchise, essentially. They got Infinity Ward on this sucker, and they released Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare, and everyone is like, this. This is what we want from a military shooter. Fun, fun, really competitive multiplayer, plus a great storyline, um, difficult campaign with really, really solid shooting mechanics, and I think the only reason it, it made it so far down this list, I mean, it's just because the franchise has been worn out. I mean, it's been just beaten to death. It's pretty thin these days. I'm, I don't think, I, I don't think I will probably ever play another Call of Duty game again, but looking back, I can appreciate Call of Duty 4 for what it was at the time, despite the fact that it started the trend that a lot of people really, really hate. I don't, I don't, it doesn't fill me with hatred like it does with some people. But despite the fact that it started what many would consider to be an unfortunate trend in video gaming, I think that they really, really had bottled something special with Call of Duty 4, which they never really managed to do again with any of the subsequent titles. So there you go, number 25. Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare. Okay, here's number 24 coming at you with Borderlands 2. Here's one of the situations where if I had included the whole series, it might have uh, got a little bit higher on this list. But if, if you're going to choose one of the two, got to go with Borderlands 2. More focused story, uh, better characters, uh, cool uh, individual abilities, plus lots of DLC support, great fun with friends uh, online, or just... Or is, can you do couch co-op? No, I think you have to, you have to link systems. Yeah, there's no, there's no split screen. Great, great co-op with friends. Makes it so, so much fun to go questing with friends. Some of the most fun I've had in group quests in a long time. Um, Borderlands 2, just 
super fun, expressive game that never once takes itself too seriously. It has an awesome villain, has some awesome enemy types, just great humor in like literally every single aspect of the game. There's not like one design aspect of the game that doesn't have at least a joke hidden somewhere in it at least once. But Borderlands 2 is an excellent game, uh, role-playing shooter. You gotta check it out if you haven't yet. Coming in at number 23 is Super Meat Boy. Unfortunately, the year it came out, I didn't play it. I don't know why I didn't play it. It's, it, it would have been right up my alley then. I didn't get, get to play it until literally, uh, I think it was 2012. Or was it last year? Might have just been last year, the first time I played Super Meat Boy. Wow, I missed out. Because Super Meat Boy is just, you know, super simple platforming basics. Jump, avoid obstacles, get to the end of these levels. And it's, it, it, it's every design choice seems almost perfect. It's very difficult, but, in, but to balance that difficulty, if, when you die, boom, you're right back at the beginning. I mean, literally, like, less than a second, you're back in the action. And it's, it's that... It's the fact that it's hard, but it doesn't penalize you in a ridiculous amounts for your death. That I think is, is one of the things that I think makes the game so, so great. And definitely worth checking out. One of the best Xbox Live titles. And is it PSN as well? I don't know. I played on Xbox Live. One of the best indie titles of the generation. Super Meat Boy at number 23. Coming in at number 22 is Little Big Planet. The PlayStation 3 exclusive. It was one of the first games I picked up with my PlayStation 3, and I'm so glad I did. Uh, it, it's a it's a platformer, but it uses sort of realistic physics, and that can take some getting used to. But playing it with a friend, exploring these levels, creating your own levels. If you're, I mean, and this is a robust level editor. One of the one of the first times I think I, I encountered a level editor, level creator that robust. I mean, you're just given tools to do anything. A lot of the, a lot of the fan created levels are as good or better than the levels in the game proper. And if if you just get it and just play the the in the levels made by the developers themselves, it's probably worth it, but going online and playing the umpteen player created levels. I mean, you could just play that game for weeks, weeks and you would never play one level twice which I think is <laughs> pretty impressive. Plus, there's a great community. There's great art style, aesthetic, very cute, very fun. I love the narrator, sort of. I'm not sure if it was the first game, but it really <laughs> seemed to popularize the, uh, the male British voiceover thing that a lot of games have been doing recently. But Little Big Planet, excellent little game. Number 21 is Super Smash Bros. Brawl. Now... For some people, this is the weakest in the series. For some people, they think it's the best in the series. I think it is the second best in the series. Uh, it, I mean, in terms of just, like, raw quality, it's probably the best. But in terms of my favorite, it's my it's still my second favorite. Super Smash Bros. Brawl, I mean, I play this game for hours with friends. And it's all about who you play it with and the time you have. I loved the Subspace Emissary. Uh, single player, or I, you can play it with multi multiplayer as well, but it's like a co-op story mode. It's the first time they really chose to flesh out the adventure mode as opposed to melee, which is my favorite in the series. Um, yeah, which was just sort of a, a series of, of of levels, but I think they they really they really made it uh, really added some depth to the adventure sort of campaign mode, which I know isn't the reason people play Super Smash Brothers, but it's it's a really nice thing to have. There's so much bonus stuff in that game. There's the stickers. There's the there's the trophies. So many different game modes you can play. If you, if you were to figure out all the permutations of all the different ways you could play that game, I'm sure it would rival. I don't know the number of possible combinations on a Rubik's cube. There's just so many little tweaks and and levers and and. Um, dials you can twist just to change the formula, tweak it ever so slightly. You can turn on items that, that you like, turn off items you don't like. Uh, it's it's just a really, really solid game. Great to play with people, and I played the ever-loving crap out of it at college, and I absolutely loved it. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a definitely a special game to me. Coming at number 20 is Halo 3. Uh, of the original trilogy, it might be my least favorite, but it's still rounded out what I consider to be one of the most important game series 
of the past decade or so. A Halo 3 finishes out, or at least at the time it finished out, Master Chief's story. Went out in a big bang after the uh, pretty uh, disappointing conclusion of Halo 2. It really took it took the story into some new new directions, and I, I gotta say, loved the uh, the gunplay as well. Obviously, they added some new weapons. I felt like, in terms of gameplay, it was close to the pinnacle of the series until it was uh, dethroned later by Halo 4. I I just don't think it. I just I think Halo 1 and Halo 2 came out at a time where I I played. I was I was going to a friend's house all the time. We were hooking up Xboxes and playing Halo for hours and hours and hours into the night and further. I mean, we would just play it absolutely constantly. It was the gold standard for first-person shooters. I think by the time Halo 3 came around, I wasn't as big into the franchise as I was back when the first two games came out. But Halo 3, definitely a special game to me. Number 19 is Braid. Uh, it was the first Xbox Live indie title I played, and in terms of thought-provoking narrative, and really, really cute, interesting, gorgeous uh, uh, gameplay, I think Braid really, really stands still among its uh, companions on there. I mean, there are a bunch of indie, indie games on Xbox Live these days, but I think Braid still stands loud and proud as one of the absolute best. I love the the manipulating of time mechanic. I love how each world twists the formula a little different way, and I I, I love the graphics, the the art style of this game. The music is so great, and uh, the story is is really hard to parse and subtle. It can be about so many different things, and the ending has a really cool twist. And if you haven't played Braid yet, you're missing out on a quintessential indie game that almost in my opinion, at least from my personal experience, sparked my love of independent games. Coming in at number 18, Mass Effect 2. Definitely here uh, harmed by the fact that I just decided to just pick one game, and if I was going to put two games from one franchise on the list, they would be in different places, because if I had put the whole trilogy as one, it definitely would have made up higher, because, and it was, this was the hardest to separate, because in terms of one big narrative, the Mass Effect trilogy is really, really successful in that. One of the most successful singular narratives across a trilogy I've seen. Just because of how your decisions in the first game carry over into the second, and your decisions in the first and second carry over into the third. I think Mass Effect 2 is, for me, the pinnacle of the series. Mass Effect 3 was very, very good, but kind of felt like more of the same after Mass Effect 2. But I love both of the games, don't get me wrong. I think I think it's one of the most important games narratively of the generation, and you really ought to get into it. Uh, Mass Effect was hard to get into for me the first game because it had a lot of really hard, a lot of RPG elements and a slow start. But they sort of trimmed away some of the RPG elements and made it more about the shooting in Mass Effect 2. And I think it, it, it they changed it for the better, at least in my opinion. Mass Effect 2, 17, Rayman Legends. Crazy good game. You all know how I feel about it. I'm doing an LP on it. I've already talked about this game a bunch. Uh, I think it is, in terms of AAA gaming, the best 2D platformer of the generation. And you got to check it out. Incredibly, incredibly fun game. Tight controls. Beautiful, beautiful graphics. Amazing music. The height of its art form, Rayman Legends, coming in at number sixteen, The Legend of Zelda: Twilight Princess. I this I, some of you may think that this is a last generation game because it technically was designed for the GameCube and merely came out on the Wii, but for me, it was the gateway into this generation. It was literally the first, well, other than Wii Sports, I guess, but it was the first what I would consider proper game of console generation seven that I played because. Well, or did I play an Xbox 360 at a friend's house before the Wii came out? I don't know. It was the first Wii game I played. Nintendo Wii, one of Nintendo's... It was basically Nintendo's last huge success. The 3DS has been doing really well. But the launch of the Wii, I mean, the, what, what an explosion that was. Amazing game. It's Zelda. What can I say? What, what, what I can only say what everybody else has already said. It, it sort of... It, it, after Wind Waker, it was a much darker story. Uh... And I just think it's a really solid game. So Twilight Princess. Number 15 is Heavy Rain. Uh, this is probably higher than 
it would be on a lot of other people's list. But in terms of crafting your own narrative, it gets a lot of points there. I love the characters in this. I love how serious your choices become and how very real the consequences are. And I love uh, the, the, the start to end, like looking back at the whole story that you felt like you had a hand in creating. And I know it's a lot of people argue that it's not much of a game, and I can't really argue with those people because their, their arguments are relatively valid and it basically just comes down to personal opinion. I think it's a game. I, I, whether or not you hate uh, quick time events or not, there are quite a few in this one. But it's an interactive narrative experience, according to that dude. I always forget his name, who made the games. And I think it's a, a, a quintessential game of the generation, and I really, really loved it. Heavy Rain. Coming at number four is The Elder Scrolls IV, Obl no, 14, sorry, is The Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion. This game is only so low because it's been made uh, redundant by Skyrim. And, but boy, in terms of like total hours I've put into a game, very few games rival Oblivion. Because I've played it all the way through three or four times. And when I say all the way through, I mean like I did all of the quests, not all the quests, but like I did Mage's Guild, Thieves' Guild, Fighters' Guild main quest, quest line, Dark Brotherhood, like, every single time. <laughs> and I think that game really, really... It was, it was one of the games that made me get an Xbox 360. It was one of the first games I picked up with the system. It was one of the launch titles. I think it was a launch title. Either that, it was very, very early in the life of the Xbox. But I think Oblivion stands as a great representation of Bethesda's craft, how, how well they can make a world, world how, how they can populate it, how they can make it feel real, and just how just crazy amounts of fun you can have just going on your own, exploring, and then, when you, and then when you get tired of doing that, you can go back and do the quests, which are also very rewarding and amazing. Oblivion is an excellent game. Coming in at number 13 is The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword. Beat out Twilight Princess, in my opinion. To me, this is the Wii Remote's finest hour. That's, that's pretty much all I need to say. It is the, it is the pinnacle of motion controls, uh, the way that there's a one-to-one -one sort of sword movement, and that plays in directly into how you fight enemies. It feels much deeper than just hitting the B button or just the sort of the little impotent uh, Wiimote raggles, waggles that you got in Twilight Princess. I loved the marriage of aesthetics of like the sort of the brighter Wind Waker aesthetics and the and the more realistic visuals from Twilight Princess, Ocarina of Time, etc. I love that marriage. I love the music in this game. The like the or fully orchestrated stuff was amazing. I thought the I thought that every single dungeon was like better than the last. It just sort of just like kept building on itself, and I, I think it really really ended up being one of the best games of the generation. One of the very best. So, uh, this is Zelda Skyward Sword. Coming in at number 12 is Red Dead Redemption. Uh, Rockstar really, really knocked it out of the park with this one. I did not expect to enjoy a spaghetti western video game. It's not an aesthetic I usually identify myself with. But, thanks to their character development, thanks to the world that they created, I, th I really think they hit on something special with Red Dead Redemption. It made a believer out of me. And, while that GTA 4 and previous Grand Theft Auto games made me a Grand Theft Auto fan, I think Red Dead Redemption made me a Rockstar fan. And it made me pay attention to everything they did ever since, and, I've, and I've been, I am indebted to Red Dead Redemption. Because I, I, don't think if it, if, I don't think if it existed, I don't think I would have played games like Max Payne 3 or Alien War. So, Red Dead Redemption. Excellent game. And finally, on today's video, coming in at number 11, is Portal 2. This ended up being a little bit lower than I thought. But it's it just it's just there's something that when you go go back to play Portal Two, you know it's just never good to, never as good the second time. I think especially with the first Portal game, there's some special magic in learning how portals work for the first time, and in meeting Glados for the first time. And Portal Two, the first time you play it, is a magical experience. It is wonderful. I love all the characters. I love Wheatley. I love. Cave Johnson, obviously GLaDOS Returns. It's an expanded game. Not every mechanic is perfectly pulled off. There's a lot of sort of downtime where you're just like looking for one little segment of of wall you can place a portal on way off in the distance, and that's not as great as, as like the actual test chambers themselves. So it does stray a little bit from the formula, I think, of what makes Portal as a game as a gameplay um, Portal's gameplay so great. But 
I can't deny that that first time I played that game, I had an incredible time. It's an excellent game. One of the best of the generation. My 11th favorite game of the generation. And next time, on Monday, we will get to the top 10. Some of you probably can guess some of them. Some of you probably feel like you probably can guess my top three if you thought about it. Or if you paid attention. But uh, we will get to it. We're going to get rid of really, really good stuff next video. So, that was a lot of games really, really fast. I, I feel like I probably short shifted a few. But... There you go, 25 through 11. This video was long as crap, I'm sorry. Next time, top 10 games of the generation, so you can disagree with me some more. See you then.